In the name of God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. I met a traveler from an antique land who said, Two vast and trunkless legs of stone stand in the desert. Near them on the sand, half sunk in a shattered vestige lies, whose frown and wrinkled lip, a sneer of cold command, tell that its sculptor well those passions read, which yet survive, stamped on these lifeless things hand that mocked them, and the heart that fed, and on the pedestal these words appeared. My name is Osmanius, king of kings. Look on my works, ye mighty and despair. Nothing beside remains, round the decay of that colossal work, boundless and bare. The lone and level sands stretch far away. It's a poem called Osmandius by Percy Shelley. It's a poem that describes an ancient statue of a once mighty king, a king who was filled with his own sense of importance, his own grandeur. And ages ago, the statue was a splendid and awe-inspiring figure. But over the centuries, it gradually deteriorated until it was finally nothing more than a ruin. Nothing of Osmandius' works remained to be seen. The nation that he once took pride in is gone. The gold he had, whatever works he had accomplished, had van vanished long ago, leaving behind nothing more than an obscure name on a broken statue, covered by the sands of time. Osmandius, this poem, is a haunting reminder of the impermanence of this world. And perhaps that's the same lesson that Jesus is trying to teach the disciples in this gospel that we've just heard. In this gospel that we've just heard this morning, Jesus and the disciples are walking and traveling through Jerusalem. And Jesus had just told the disciples not to be taken in by appearances. He had just told them that a few coins given by a poor widow to the treasury it's more spiritual value than wealth that's given out of abundance. But as they're traveling through the city, the disciples are captivated by the beauty, by the grandeur of the temple. They're awestruck by this ostentatious display of wealth, by all the precious stones that it's covered in. And Jesus tries to snap them out of it. He prophesies his dark and foreboding events that are soon to come. He tells them that soon they'll be arrested. They'll be persecuted. The nations will rise up against each other. He tells them and warns them about coming earthquakes and famines, plagues, dreadful signs from heaven, until at last the temple will be, will be torn down and every stone ripped apart. It's a grim and dismal future ahead that he's predicting. The disciples would have every right to give up right then and there if that's where Jesus stopped. But it's not. Jesus continues on, and the most important part of his prophecy is almost missed in this last sentence of what he says. Not a hair of your head will perish. By your endurance, you will gain your souls. Jesus essentially tells the disciples here that regardless of how bad things get, he will be with them. The life will get hard, but not to lose hope. And as time goes on and on, I think this is something that we all need to be reminded of more and more often. Throughout life, there are times when it seems like everything around us is falling apart. At times, it seems like there's nothing left to hope for. Last week, people across the country watched Spellbound as the impeachment proceedings took place, a sign of the continued deadlock and dysfunction of our political system on both sides. A new study has been released saying that climate change is not only happening, but is accelerating far past what was previously expected. You can 
read about protests in Hong Kong and how oppressive they're being responded to and the violence that's being displayed. Last summer, the whole world watched in shock as Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris burned. And in less than a day, nearly a thousand years of history went up in smoke. With so much dysfunction, with so much brokenness in the world, we can sometimes find ourselves getting lost in cynicism. We find ourselves wondering, what's the point of it all? Why bother building up and somebody else can just come along later and rip it all down? It's times like this when we need to be reminded that the value is in the effort itself, not the outcome. Jesus' prophecy is right. The temple was destroyed. But the Wailing Wall is still a holy place revered by millions and billions around the world. Notre Dame may have burned, but countless lives were enriched during the thousand years that it stood. Jesus' words to the disciples in this gospel reminds us that even when it looks like the world around us is in chaos, there is always hope. It reminds us that God is always with his people and meets us where we are, regardless of how broken our world becomes. This gospel is not just a reminder of the world and how impermanent it is, not just a reminder that nothing we build will last forever. It's also a reminder of where we put our hope. It's a proclamation that God's faithful love remains with us even when everything around us seems to be falling apart. In times in life when we are left shocked and bewildered, the things that we trusted in are suddenly gone, we remember that our hope doesn't reside in this world. Our hope is based on God's love for us and nothing more. The only thing that is constant in this world is that the only thing constant is God's continued and everlasting love for us. It's an appropriate reminder for us as we prepare for Christ the King Sunday next week. Reminding that Christ is King, that Christ is Lord over all. When everything in the world seems to be just so broken so much of the time, we need to be reminded that it's still being held in the palm of God's hand. We need to be reminded that Christ does not promise us a life that's going to be easy or simple. And if anything, he warns us that our immediate future is going to be harder if we decide to follow him. But the rewards will last forever. And not one hair on our heads will perish. Even if we're like Osmandius, and all our works are forgotten or torn apart, we remain in hope because God's love for us is eternal. Amen. Amen.